Welcome to Pure Passion. I'm your host, David Kyle Foster. Today's guest is Peter Horobin, founder and executive director of LL Ministries. Headquartered in England, LL Ministries has bases throughout the world where people can find deliverance, healing, and discipleship. Now, I've spoken at their awesome bases in Scotland, England, and Australia, but they also have a presence in the US, Canada, Singapore, India, South Africa, Hungary, and many other places around the globe. Peter is best known in the Christian world for writing the classic two-volume set entitled Healing Through Deliverance, which you can get through our website. Last time Peter was with us, he shared vital biblical insights on soul ties, family line curses, and other aspects of deliverance ministry, especially as they pertain to gaining freedom from sexual sin and bondage. So let's look in and see what God has for us today through the teaching ministry of Peter Horobin. Jesus exercised authority over demons, which tells us that he knew what they were. He delegated authority to believers to cast them out. Scripture doesn't actually give us a huge amount of understanding about their precise nature. What we do know is that all demonic powers are under control of Satan. What we also know is that when Satan was cast out of heaven, probably a third of the heavenly hosts were cast out with him. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3 talks about a third of the heavenly host. Whether or not the demons are all fallen angels is an interesting theological discussion. <laughs> there is a scripture which talks about spirits of demons. What is a spirit of demon? I'm not sure. In some ways, actually, I'm not too worried. The thing that actually I'm most concerned about is that Jesus gave us authority over them, whatever they were. They do have an identity, they are able to respond and speak out. They do have characteristics and, and have come across many, many different characteristics in the demonic. They take on a characteristic of the sin that people commit so that if a person sins sexually and the spirit comes in at that moment, it can be a spirit of lust so that the spirit takes on the nature that we give it through our own sin. There may be other spirits which are totally restricted to one particular form of sinful behavior, or greed, or whatever it might be. But they're definitely spiritual beings. They have an identity of their own. They like to control and take authority that we have given them. They can only exercise authority as we give them as a result of our sin, or the sin of those who, who, under whose covering we have been, like parents, grandparents, and so on. Spiritual beings under Satan's authority because we have authority over Satan through Jesus, we can also have authority over them. So whatever their actual nature, they're under the authority of Satan and they're under the authority of Jesus and we can cast them out. At night, people often have visitations from spirits. And an incubus spirit is one that will invade a woman sexually and have sexual relationships with her. And she actually has all the sensations of having a sexual relationship. And the succubus spirit is that which does the same with a man. Those spirits have been given a lot of rights, and a lot of power, as a result of very bad sexual behavior down the generation lines, usually. Usually associated with witchcraft or Satanism, where sexual relationships have actually become part of a ritual. And those sexual relationships, when they become part of a ritual, are empowered through the worship of Satan that is involved in those rituals. So they are powerful. They can only exercise rights in the areas where they have rights, so it's usually down the generation lines. They can be dealt with through confession and repentance of the generational things. 
It's interesting that in Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah says, we confess the sins that we have committed and those of our ancestors. He said, I and my ancestors, we have sinned. And so people who are struggling with a, a succubus or an incubus spirit, I always lead them in that sort of prayer. Obviously, some of their own sexual things have to be dealt with first. If there are things they've been involved in, that they have given power to these spirits, then those have to come to the light and be dealt with. But having dealt with those, we then go to the place of saying, I and my ancestors, we have sinned. I am part of my ancestors. I confess my ancestral sin without actually having to know the details of it. We confess that our ancestors have sinned. And we ask God to cleanse us from the consequences of that generational sin. And then I'll pray a breaking of that generational line. I'll ask God just to cut that line so that there's no longer any power down the generation line. Now, usually that works. Now, there may be situations where you do all that and the people are still struggling. And it may be that there are other generational powers, other rituals that have taken place which we haven't yet faced. But in all cases, you work through it bit by bit. And all of the people that you pray with in this sort of way, they, they see more light coming into the life. They're seeing progress at every stage so that they know that they're actually making headway. But the power of succubus and incubus is ultimately simply a delegated power from Satan. And because Jesus has authority over Satan and he's delegated that authority to believers, it can be dealt with. I believe that there are ruling spirits, principalities and powers which are talked about in scripture, which are high spiritual powers controlling areas of land or controlling groups of people. Uh, I remember praying with a man who was a homosexual and he said, I can go into any city in the world and within 20 minutes I can be in the homosexual community. He said, I go into the city and I don't have to actually ask anyone's advice or where to go. I just know where to go, to go this way, that way, the other way, go to this place and I finish up in the community. And as we prayed for him and he was desperate to be set free because he knew that the behavior was ungodly it was unscriptural and he wanted to actually get the other side of it and he was truly confessing the, 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 the ungodliness of it and repenting and wanting to be free and as we prayed for him we found that there was a control between the spirit of homosexuality that was in him and the ruling spirits in the universe and that ruling spirit, elemental spirit, that principality, whatever you want to call it, actually entered into him as we were praying and started actually shouting at me. And it was, did not want to lose control over this individual. You see, there was an external spirit that saw that this man was entering into freedom and it was trying to hang on. And we asked God to, to break that power and uh, it, he never had any more problem with it. But it, that, that taught me, it was one of those learning curves that God takes you through. It doesn't happen every time you minister, but it, God shows you these things so that way you can pray for other people without even having to uh, get involved with the detail. Because you, you've, you've learnt your authority, you've gained your authority as you've actually ministered. And so there are those ruling spirits. Now, whatever you call them, in some ways again, doesn't matter. Uh, they probably do have generational power coming from the earliest uh, elemental spirits of the universe who were given power through mankind's sins, such as, as Baal. And people talk about Leviathan, another one in scripture, and Jezebel, and all these controlling spiritual beings and spiritual powers. They are there. And we can't cast them out because their time has not yet come. When Jesus comes again, he's going to deal with them. We can actually be free of their control by living a godly and clean life. Hi, I'm Andy Reese with the Freedom Resource, and I'm here to share some, some little vignettes, some principles about freedom. Uh, I really appreciate David Foster allowing me to do this. I, I, I work with a ministry called Sozo Ministry, or the Sozo Model. And uh, the things I'm sharing are some, some foundations that we've learned over the years. And, and I want to share something with you uh, today that is real interesting. A lot of scriptures seem kind of normal until you really think about them. And here's one that really throws me. In Mark 1 it says, And Jesus was preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Now, I don't know about you, but my idea of a Saturday synagogue service was not 
Seth and Enoch floating around, green slime, heads twisting and screaming. It's just guys reading scripture. It's just normal people, just like us. And yet there was, a, there was an enemy who in some way controlled some of them, who in some way influenced them. Um, and there's always this question, uh, this, this question uh, especially with Christians, that is, can a Christian have a demon? Well, uh, as my friend Chris Valadin says, sure, but why would they want one? Well, really, the Bible talks a lot about demons and Christians. It talks about them as hidden enemies, and we have hidden enemies. Let me give you an example. There's a scripture that all of us are familiar with that says, be angry but do not sin, Ephesians 4. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and what's next? Don't give the devil an opportunity. Now that word opportunity is the word Greek word topos, which means ground. That is, I've given ground to the devil. Now what does somebody's life look like who has let the sun go down on their anger? Every night for 20 years since their father abused them. Well, they would have given lots of ground to the devil. There's, there's places in their life, there's landing strips, there's easements that they've given up and they don't have full control there. Or here's another one. Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 says, I'm afraid lest as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And then he goes on and talks about people who have this complicated, hyper-spiritual religion. And, and Paul says that is a doctrine of demons. In other words, there is a demonic influence that's pulling the chain. There's a puppet master. And while we don't always in ministry encounter demons head on, we always seem to encounter their handiwork because there are strong holds inside of us. And a stronghold is something that has a strong hold on us. It's a place inside of us that we don't have full control. It's, it could be a temper. It could be the way we look at ourselves. It could be our sexual appetites. But demons, as, as we've seen, are legalistic and opportunistic. Just like a germ. You cut yourself, it doesn't always get infected, but sometimes it does. And that's because germs are opportunistic. Demons are the same way. Jesus could say, uh, Simon Peter saying, oh, Jesus, not you, don't go to Jerusalem. And Jesus looks right through Simon to the puppet master behind him. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, I'm sure Peter had a bad afternoon after that, wondering, well, I, I thought it was just me saying that. And Jesus said, no, it wasn't just you saying that. But there's a puppet master behind you. Satan comes in and he doesn't come in and say, hi, I'm Satan. I'm here to steal, kill, and destroy your life, drag you to hell, have a nice day, want to come. All of us would run screaming. But, but he says, for example, let me take me. Now, I started growing bald when I was born, okay, early on in my life. And, and so there would be this voice in my head, and it wouldn't say, you're ugly or you're bald, but it would say, I'm ugly, I'm bald. Satan comes in the first person singular, and he weaves his thoughts in with our thoughts. And we begin to believe them, and we begin to bank on them, and we begin to, to see, ener see some energy in that area. And pretty soon, because see, deception means to cause to believe a lie. And we believe a lie, and we're held captive by that lie. Demons come to attack, pervert human personality, attitude, emotions, minds, thought patterns, physical appetites, and drives. They lodge in parts of our personality. I, I'm reading now this list because I want to get it right. They entice, harass, torture, torment, compel, enslave, defile, deceive, manipulate, dominate, accuse, tempt, cause sickness and infirmity, intimidate, and help cause addictions. That's a whole lot of stuff. A lot of people are held captive. I don't know very many Christians who haven't been susceptible to demonic influence in their life. We're going to talk more about this, but I want to tell you the good news. And the good news is Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil and to free captives just like us. Mandy Reese with the Freedom Resource. Bless you. Can a Christian have a demon? That's a, a question that lots of people ask because they, they like to think that Christians are exempt from the demonic. They think that the moment a, a person is converted that there'll be no demons there. Experience tells differently because the only people who actually come to, for help, for prayer, are Christians and the only people out of whom I cast demons are Christians and they get a lot of healing, a lot of deliverance. So we, we have a problem that some people look theologically at the issue and say well surely a Christian can't have a demon 
And yet the experience of those involved in this ministry is that it's Christians who get deliverance. Now, where there is a difference between your theology and your experience, then that's telling us that there's something wrong with our understanding of theology. We have to actually then go back to scripture, go back to square one and say, God, I want your understanding of this. Now, part of the problem in our Western culture arises from the understanding of the word possessed. The Greek word dynamitsomai is often translated in our most well-used Bibles as being possessed by devils. Now, it doesn't actually mean that. It means to have a demon. And any Greek scholar will tell you that, that that word means having a demon. It doesn't actually mean possessed by devils. Now, the word possessed means owned. If I possess something, I own it. This Bible's mine. I went into the Christian bookshop, I handed them over some money, I paid the price, and this became my possession. And once I paid for it, I possessed it. It was mine, I belonged to it. It belonged to me. Now that's what possession is about, it's to do with ownership. Now when you become a Christian, you are bought with a price. And Romans tells us that the price that was paid was the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now if the price that was paid for you was the blood of Jesus, paid by the Father and the Son, then we are his possession, because he's paid the price. So the moment you become a Christian, you are possessed by God. You're owned by him. So the, the, only, sort of in, in, the, the, the only indication in scripture about possession is actually not to do with demons, it's to do with actually being possessed by God. I can say to you, praise God, you're possessed. Because you're possessed by the one who paid the price for you. Now, if I go and buy an old house that's got a lot of timber in it, on the day that I complete the sale, I close the sale, pay the money over, the lawyers give me the keys, I take possession of the property. That's the word we generally use. I take possession of the property. So I go to the property. It is now under my ownership. And I start looking all over the property, and I discover in the roof timbers that it's full of termites. Now, I possess the house but the house has termites. Now what do I do? I call in an, an agency that sprays it with chemicals and gets rid of them. So I come and deliver the house of the termites. Now when we become a Christian, we are taken possession of by God. But he takes us just as we are. We don't clean ourselves up before we come. The old hymn says, just as I am, I come with all the mess, with all the muck, and Jesus takes possession of our life. And the process of sanctification is, means becoming more like Jesus. Now, we don't instantly live and behave and think like Jesus. Instantly, we enter into relationship with God through Jesus. But then Jesus comes and starts cleaning us up. And deliverance is part of that cleaning up process. It's cleaning the house dealing with the holes that the enemy has. So deliverance ministry is actually for Christians largely. What does it mean for Satan to be defeated by Jesus? Does it mean that he was exterminated or does it mean that he didn't overcome Jesus? That's the key question. What it actually means is that Jesus overcame him personally and that no matter what Satan threw at Jesus, he could not get Jesus to come under his authority. So when Jesus actually died, he was not under Satan's authority, so that death could not hold him. Because of the fall, we're all subject to death. Jesus was without sin, he was not subject to death. So when he physically died, the resurrection was certain. He didn't come underneath Satan's control. So when we say that Jesus defeated Satan at the cross, it means that Jesus himself didn't come under Satan's control and Satan did not overcome Jesus. But Satan is still the God of this world. In John 1, John 5, 19, John, many years after Jesus has died and been raised from the dead and gone back to heaven, he's saying the whole world's under the control of the evil one. You see the evidence of it all, all around. Now, what it means, therefore, for us to enter into that victory is that with that delegated authority that Jesus has, we can actually take authority over the powers of darkness and we can resist the enemy. It doesn't mean to say that Satan has been exterminated from planet Earth. 
He's still there. He's still trying to prevent people entering into relationship with Jesus so that they will know him. The time when Satan is finally dealt with, talked about in Revelation, when Jesus will give that instruction and Satan and all the powers of darkness will finally be thrown into the lake of fire. But that's not happened yet. Temptation and sin are not the same thing. Jesus suffered temptation and he was perfect. He never sinned and he still suffered temptation. And temptation is all about Satan trying to get control over our lives. And if Satan had a right to actually tempt Jesus, let's not think that we can be even above the Son of God. We are, as human beings, vulnerable to temptation on planet Earth because man gave authority on planet Earth to Satan and the powers of darkness. And temptation is something that we will all experience for the rest of our days. Now, that may sound like bad news, but the good news is that for the rest of our days also, we have authority to resist it, or scripture in other places says, flee from it. Flee from sexual immorality, flee from the sins that we are being tempted into. Now, scripture also talks about besetting sins, about sins which are particularly difficult for us. When we actually ourselves have either had a strong generational influence of a particular sinful behavior or life pattern, or we ourselves have been deeply involved in a particular sin, then our whole personality has been actually affected by that. There is a vulnerability there. I look at it like this. I, for my hobby, I restore engines of old cars. And sometimes the cylinder block can be cracked. And that crack can be repaired. But an engine that's had a cracked cylinder block repaired, I would never push to the limit. I would only ever run it at a fairly low revs and not try and get too much out of it because there's a vulnerability at that point. And when people have themselves been caught in a whole way of life that is ungodly, then there is a vulnerability in that place and that area. And so temptation may be greater at that place. The authority that Jesus gives us and the love that he has for us enables us to resist temptation. It doesn't actually take us out of the world in which we live. A man who has struggled with temptation for pornography, for example, can't help but notice the hoardings where there's a scantily clad lady being used as part of the advertisement. He notices it. It's what he does with it that determines whether that has a spiritual effect on him which is dangerous. We, we are not exempt from the world that we live in and from all the things that we see. And we never will be, because that's where this is where God has put us. Whom the sun sets free shall be free indeed. It's, it's a wonderful scripture. And it is absolutely true that Jesus gives us his authority and through relationship with God, we have his power to be able to resist temptation. But we're living in a fallen world where the evidence of the enemy's hold is all around us. A man who has had temptations in the sexual area cannot say, well, I'm never going to see a sexually explicit advertisement again because they're there all around you. It's what you do with what you see, whether you actually dwell on it and begin to lust after it, or whether you actually resist it and move on. See, there's a very interesting scripture which talks in John chapter 8 about truth will set you free. And sometimes I, when I'm teaching, I, I would tease people and say, what does the scripture say? Does it say the truth will set you free? And they say, yes. And I say, no. <laughs> because actually the scripture doesn't say the truth will set you free. It says if you actually do the things that Jesus is telling you to do, and that means be a disciple, you will then know the truth and then the truth will set you free. One vital lesson that I relearn every time I hear Peter Horobin teach is that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. Well, okay, it was the Holy Spirit who actually taught us that through the Apostle Peter in his first epistle. But 
it is illuminated once again for us through the biblical teaching of Peter Harbin. If you'd like to learn more of what Peter has gleaned from God's Word, as well as through the countless ministry sessions that he's led at LL ministry bases around the world, just visit our website to look for Peter's book, Healing Through Deliverance, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Perhaps God has shown you an area in your life that needs ministry on today's program. LL Ministries has bases all over the world, so there's bound to be a seminar, class, or conference taking place near you. Visit their website at www.ll.org. And I'm David Kyle Foster. For all of us here at Pure Passion, praying that you will find the healing and freedom that Christ won for you on the cross as you seek Him with all your heart. God steps, I'm taking.